turn to Psalms 23. This is probably the most familiar passage of Scripture to anybody here. Any, one of the first chapters in the Bible, verses in the Bible that I was introduced to was Psalms chapter 23. And it's probably been read by me uh, since that time more than any other passage in the Scripture. But there's a tremendous uh, teaching and a tremendous message to our hearts from Psalms 23. Psalms 23, beginning with verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me in the side of still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in, my, in thy presence, or in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Psalms 23 is one of the most beloved passages that we have in the Bible. And we would probably all agree with that this morning if we've read that chapter very often. It's one of the crown jewels of Scripture. Children memorize it. Young and old die with it on their lips. And it brings comfort and peace to those who are brokenhearted. Psalms 23 tells us more about God, more about ourselves, more about life, and more about death, and more about time and eternity than any other passage that we have in the Scripture. This is a great psalm of affirmation of God. It confirms His sufficiency, His strength, and His salvation. It speaks of His peace, His presence, and his provision. Now keep in mind that David is an older man. He's getting ready to go to heaven. He's experienced a lot of various and difficult valleys in his life and mountaintop experiences as well. But he's coming now to look to the chief shepherd. As you know, uh, he was a shepherd himself. David was a shepherd before he was anointed to be king of Israel. But now the role is reversed. He's taking on the role of the sheep, and he's talking to the chief shepherd. It is a great chapter. And the first thing that we see from this passage of Scripture as we read it is that the good shepherd provides all of our needs. David said, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He provides green pastures. That is, he provides nutrition for us. When we sit down to eat a meal, or we look in a cabinet and we see the food, the refrigerator, the food, wherever we look that God has provided food for us. We need to be grateful and thankful because God is the one that provides the green pastures, the, the nutrition. And he also provides the still water, hydration. We have water because of the graciousness of our God who is sovereign over this universe. And then he restoreth my soul spiritual needs. Now David in writing this, he'd experienced that. He'd, he'd experienced the restoration of his soul after his great sin that brought him so much sorrow and so much heartache and so much pain and, and so long in the valleys after that experience. God had restored him and made him useful. So David knew about restoration. And I think many of us know also about restoration, how God has restored us when we have failed him and fallen into sin. He restores us. And then he leadeth me in the paths of righteousness. David speaks of, of positional righteousness. Positional righteousness comes when we accept Christ as our Savior. 
Savior. We're clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. Someone said that you can drive down the streets and, and walk down the sidewalks of this world in the best clothes that man can buy, but you'll never walk down the streets of God's glory world unless you're robed in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, you can't go to heaven without being robed in the righteousness of the Savior, that positional righteousness. So that's what David is talking about. He's talking about positional righteousness, and he's also talking about practical righteousness. You see, left alone, uh, we go astray, but the good shepherd leads us. When we have the positional righteousness, then that equips us to have practical righteousness. That is, we live and walk and serve in this world as godly people and godly women, and people see Jesus in us because we have practical righteousness. It means to do right, means to act right and be right. And God God never leaves us and he leads us and equips us on that journey. Now, David tells us why the good shepherd does all of these things for us. And you look at the passage there. Look what he says for his namesake, for his namesake. He's doing all of this for the namesake of the Lord Jesus Christ, that Christ would be lifted up. Now, as you go through the scripture and think about and study about and do reference on the name of Jesus, everything that we do, we're to do in the name of the Lord Jesus. The Bible says that we are saved in the name of Jesus. In Acts 4.12, what does it say? It says that neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. His name is a saving name, and his name has several different uh, significations. Number one, his name signifies suffering. He suffered for us. He suffered three ways for us. Actually, his suffering began before he left heaven's glory, because when he left heaven, he came down to this earth, and he took on the form of man and he divested himself of his deity. He was always God, but he did not uh, always exercise the powers of God when he was here. So he came to this earth and he suffered. He suffered physically. The Bible tells us that in his lifetime that he said, he said that the birds have nests, but the son of man doth not have a place to lay his head. So a place that he could call home, a place that he could called, this is my house. He did not have it while he was here. And he was ridiculed and, and rejected by his own people. And then he was, he was, he was, uh, 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 punished and, and suffered emotionally and physically. And then the greatest suffering of all was the spiritual separation and the spiritual suffering. When Jesus died on the cross, the Bible tells us that God the Father turned his back on the Lord Jesus and there the Savior hung on the cross. And Jesus uh, cried out those words, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He had never experienced that before. Before. But when he suffered, when he suffered on the cross, he experienced separation from God. So his name signifies suffering and it signifies separation of himself from God the Father. But it also signifies our separation because when, when man fell in the Garden of Eden, rebelled against God, disobeyed God, the Bible tells us that right then we lost our spiritual connection with God. We were severed from God and we need to be reconciled back to God and Jesus went to that cross and he died on the cross to bring us back into favor with God and that's the only way that we can have favor with God is through his son the Lord Jesus Christ. It also signifies substitution. He died in our place. Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. All through the Bible, we have the substitutionary death of Jesus. He died in our place, in our sin. So his name signifies suffering. His name signifies separation. 
separation. His name signifies substitution. And we pray in the name of Jesus, according to John 14, 13 through 14. And when we ask in the name of Jesus, we are asking on the basis of his credibility. Not on our credibility, but on the basis of his credibility. We serve in the name of Jesus. Uh, Colossians 3, 17 says, all that we do, we do to the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. We worship in the name of Jesus. When two or three are gathered together in my name, we worship him and we suffer in the name of Jesus. And many Christians are suffering today across our world and they suffer in the name of Jesus. I want you to turn to Acts chapter 5 in your Bibles and, and these, these verses are, are very touching. The whole chapter is a very touching passage of Scripture as you look at the, these apostles as they suffer for the cause of Christ. Uh, Acts chapter 5 begins with the account of Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, they lied to God and they lied to the church and, and God struck them to death right there on the scene. And then the apostles perform these uh, mighty miracles. God uses them to perform unheard of miracles. And the believers were more added to the Lord. Multitudes, both men and women, were added to the Lord. And then uh, the Sadducees, the, the council, the rulers of the, of the city, they didn't like that because uh, he was drawing attention to himself. So they, uh, so they arrested them. They put them in prison. And an angel came and released them. And they were back there in the temple and back there on the streets preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and the, the council got word of that. So they came back and they arrested them again. And they were going to put them to death. But there was a man by the name of Gamaliel. Gamaliel was a scholar. He was a respected man. He was uh, one that was well-trained, well-educated. And uh, the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, all the religious groups, they respected him. So they went to him and he told them, says, listen, uh, you shouldn't do that. Uh, if this ministry, if what he's doing is of God, it will advance. But if it's not, it'll just fade away. So he persuaded them not to kill the Apostle Paul. I mean, I'm sorry, the, the apostles. Uh, and they didn't. But they beat them instead and let them go and told them, don't you preach in my name anymore. Don't say another word. Don't open your mouth about this Jesus and about the gospel. But then look at verse 40. After they've been beaten here, and to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for what? To suffer for his name. And daily in the temple and in the house, they ceased not to teach and to preach Jesus Christ. So we, we suffer in the name of Jesus. When, when you're persecuted, when you suffer for Christ, just take joy in that because you're suffering in the name of Jesus. And then we come to the second thing that I want to share with you from this chapter. Uh, the second thing is that the good shepherd gives us peace in the valley. Verse 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley, the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Now the phrase, the valley of the shadow of death, literally means a place of deep gloom. A place of, of black darkness. It refers to a, any dark and gloomy experience. Now, we don't have long, or that is, we don't live long until we realize that life has many dark valleys. You understand that? Many dark valleys. We have sickness. Sickness is a valley. Many of you have, have just been through some very difficult sickness. Some of you are going through sickness now. Most of us have experienced uh, times of sickness. And uh, it's, a, 
it's a valley. Loneliness is a valley. Many people are experiencing loneliness, even in the crowds and, uh, of the world. In the, in the football stadiums, you'll see people uh, that are lonely. You see, just being in a crowd doesn't keep you from being lonely. Loneliness is a valley. Depression is a valley. Most people experience some kind of depression in their life. Failure is a valley. Did you fail in, the, in a business? Did you fail in doing a job? That is a valley. And death is a valley. And there are many valleys, many valleys between grace and glory. In the valley, the Lord is with us. Now, isn't that a blessing to know that in the valley, the Lord is with us. Are you listening now? Listen to me. In the valley, the Lord is with us. He said, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Now, the shepherd had a rod to protect the sheep. And the rod was made from a sapling. Do y'all know what a sapling is? Everybody in my generation, I know, knows what a sapling is. Because a sapling was where they got the limbs, right? They got the limbs to apply the uh, loving chastisement to us. And, and a sapling, a sapling, that's what, that's what the shepherd got. The rod was made from a sapling, and the shepherd would dig the sapling out of the ground, and he would take the root, and he would round it off, and it would be smooth. And he would uh, get it just just the way he wanted it, just the right size. Then he would put pieces of metal in the end of it, and the rod became a weapon in the hand of the shepherd. And they were able to become very uh, accurate in their throwing that uh, rod. And when the lions came, the bears came, and various uh, animals that were coming to try to do something with the sheep or hinder the sheep, the shepherd uh, in his accuracy with that rod would throw it and he would run those animals away. Had the rod for the protection of the sheep. And then the shepherd had a staff to guide the sheep. Now the staff was also made from a sapling. And the sapling was cut from the top to the ground. And the shepherd would soak it in the water until it was pliable. Then he would bend the top of the sapling to make a shepherd's crook. And when it was uh, uh, bent to the point where he wanted it to be, he would tie it and then let it dry. And when it dried, he would take the tie off of it and he would have a shepherd's crook. Now, he would use that shepherd's crook uh, to get the sheep close to him. And when they were crossing some water, if the uh, sheep got too close to the edge of the bank, he would take that shepherd's crook and reach over and pull them to him. And uh, if he had a sheep that he wanted to be close to, take the shepherd's crook and, and he'd pull the sheep close to him. And every night he'd take the shepherd's crook and he would count them one by one. So the shepherd's crook was very important to him. Now here, the rod is a picture of the Word of God. What is the greatest protection we have against our enemy? What is the greatest protection we have against the devil himself? I'll tell you what it is. It's the Word of God. And how do I know that? It's because Jesus used the Word of God when he was dealing with Satan out there in the wilderness 40 days and 40 nights. Every time Jesus was tempted by Satan, he always came back to him with the word of God. So when you are tempted in your life, know the scripture. That's the reason it's so important that you study the scripture. That's the reason it's so important that you avail yourself to small group Bible studies. That's the reason it's so important that you go to a Bible believing, Bible preaching, Bible teaching church so that you'll have the word of God in your life. So when the temptations come, you can just uh, fight right back with the word of God. And when he wanted 
wanted to, when he wanted the sheep to be near him, uh, he counted the sheep. And when the Lord wants us to be near him, what does he do? He reaches out with uh, the staff, which is a symbol of the Holy Spirit, represents the Holy Spirit. And when he wants to be close to us, he reaches out with the Holy Spirit and he draws us to himself. I remember one of my pastors used to say, I'd hear him say it many times, he said, sometimes uh, the Holy Spirit just pricks my heart and I get my Bible and I walk off down to the field because I know God is wanting to spend some time with me. So the rod is the word of God and we use that against the enemy. The staff is a picture of the Holy Spirit. And listen, the staff being the picture of the Holy Spirit, what does he do when we stray? When we stray, like the sheep goes astray, the shepherd used the shepherd's crook to pull him back. When we go astray, when we step out of line, quickly the Holy Spirit touches us. Quickly the Holy Spirit brings conviction to us. Quickly he draws our attention to what we're doing and brings us from that wayward path. And the, they comfort us. The rod and the staff, they comfort us. Comfort literally means to strengthen with. The Lord never promised us that we wouldn't have valleys. Nowhere in the Bible does he promise us that we won't have valleys. But he does promise us, he does promise us the presence of the shepherd. And the word comfort here in this passage literally means to strengthen with. We're going to have valleys and we're going to uh, experience very difficult times. But the Holy Spirit is the one that strengthens us. And one of the deepest valleys that we experience on this earth is the death of a loved one. It's a long valley. And all of us have gone through death in our families. And we know that it is a long valley sometimes. But we must keep walking. Notice David said, I walk through. David didn't say, I walk in the valley. But he said, I walk through the valley. Now, valley means that there's an entrance and there is an exit. So God is with us in the valleys and he walks with us through the valley. The indication is that one day we'll walk out of that valley and the Lord Jesus Christ will still be with us. Don't get stuck in the valley. You don't want to stay in the valley. When I pastored it at Martin, Tennessee, uh, there was a, a man and his wife there. And they, were, they would come to me and talk to me about their son that had been killed in an automobile accident when he was about uh, 19 to 20 years old. And as they talked to me about that, I thought it had just happened. But it hadn't just happened. When I went to visit with them, they said, here's a picture of our son. And he was in the Navy at the time. Here's a picture of him, they said. And then uh, uh, they took me to his room and said, here's his room. It's just like it was when he left us. And I saw the pictures. I saw the furnishings. I saw things in that room that I knew that it had been a long time. And you know how long it had been? Been 20 years. 20 years they had walked in the valley. They stopped walking. You see, the Lord wants us to continue to walk, to walk out of the valley with him. Go on. Keep walking. We can't stop walking. Well, uh, the Bible tells us clearly that when we have difficult times, we have the rod, the word of God. We have the staff the Holy Spirit. He's there. The Word is there. The Holy Spirit is there to bring the peace that we need. And then there's another thing. The Good Shepherd prepares a table for us. Uh, thou prepares the table before us in the, in the presence of mine enemies. Well, in the springtime, here's what the shepherd would do. The shepherd would go up into the high mountain area, out of the way places, and he would search for an ideal uh, feeding ground. It'd be, it's called a table land. And he would begin to prepare a table land for the sheep to graze and to rest. 
He would uh, remove physical hindrances that were there. And he would pull out the poisonous weeds. And he would look for signs of enemies of the sheep like wolves and bears and, and coyotes. And he would remove any enemies of the, of the sheep. And he would look for good bedding for the sheep so that they'd have a nice place to lay down. And he would prepare the soil and he would put salt and other minerals on the soil and cultivate the land. So the sheep in the summer would have a place to, to have a lush tableland to feed upon. The tableland. Now let's look at the practical standpoint from this. First of all, the Lord prepares a table for us. Everything we have in the spiritual realm has been prepared for us on the cross of Calvary. The death of Jesus on the cross. That's God's table land for us. His shed blood in our place. His, his crucifixion in our place. His taking our sins upon himself. Himself taking the sacrifice and the judgment of God upon him for us to give us eternal life, to give us peace and to give us joy in our Christian walk. Do you know what's on that table? Have you ever thought about that? You ever, do you know what's on that table? First of all, there is forgiveness of all of our sins on that table. Now, isn't that something to, to joy about? To know that all of our sins are forgiven. The Bible says when Jesus died on that cross, that he paid for our past sins, our present sins, our future sins. All of our sins are under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you may think you have a lot of needs in your life, but the greatest need that you have in your life is to know that your sins are forgiven and you can drive out there in your car or you can go to your house tonight and put your head down on your pillow and if you know that your sins are forgiven, that brings you peace and joy, unspeakable and full of glory. That's on the table. All of our sins are forgiven. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit is on the table. The anointing of the oil of the Holy Spirit is on the table. Eternal life is on the table. Joy and peace is on the table. That's what's there. Table of all tables prepared for us at the cross. We know that David is talking about our lives today here on this earth because he said in the presence of my enemies, there's no enemies in heaven, but the enemies are here. So he's talking about the joy that we experience right here on this earth where God has prepared that table through his son and the shed blood of the Savior for us to receive all the benefits of the blood of Christ. The anointing oil is a picture of the life God gives to the believer. He said in verse 5, Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. The oil is the emblem of the Holy Spirit, and my cup runneth over. This uh, is... Uh, is an emblem or an expression that refers to the spirit control life, the abundant life, the life beyond measure, the higher ground type life that we have in Christ when we're filled and controlled by His Spirit. You see, the Lord did not come to give us a meager existence. The Lord came, us to, give, came to give us the abundant life. That doesn't mean material witnesses uh, or material possessions, that is. It means that we will have a life that is meaningful and purposeful. The abundant life. And then there's one other thing he says. The, the good shepherd will take us home. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David turns his eyes toward home. David's come to the end of his life. He's an old man. He stopped thinking about this world so much. And his family even and the material things that he has attained and his great uh, history of being the king of Israel. That's not on his mind so much. Heaven is on his mind. Home is on his mind. He said, I'm going home. David spoke with assurance of heaven. The word surely is a word of certainty. The word dwell means to settle down and be at home with. David said, I'm ready to go to heaven. I'm ready to settle down with God. I'm ready to settle down in my permanent place of dwelling. Now it's important to know that you have a place in the place that God is preparing. David said, the Lord is my shepherd. 
the Lord, not just any God. We have people in this, uh, in this uh, postmodern world we live in, the world of pluralism. Uh, they say it doesn't make any difference who you serve. It doesn't make any difference who your God is, just so you are worshiping some kind of God if you want to worship a God or you don't want, or you don't want to even have a God. They say, that's you. That's okay. You're all right. But listen, David said, the Lord, the Lord, the God. He's not talking about one God for Christians and one God for Muslims and one God for, for Hindus and one God for Mormons and one God for all the other religions of the world. Everybody having a different God. That's not what he's saying. There is one God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They are one. They are equal. They are one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God, a Hebrew, a, a Hebrew now. And in the beginning, God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and it is a plural now that takes a singular verb in that verse. Now that's unusual, isn't it? Well, it's really not unusual when you think about how that God is one. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. There is one God and don't let anybody tell you that it doesn't make any difference which God you serve. It does make a difference which God you serve and it makes a difference what you believe about the Lord Jesus Christ because if you reject him as being the son of God as being the savior of being God incarnate you cannot be saved because Jesus said if you don't believe who I am and accept who I am you cannot be saved and you cannot go to heaven he is God the only God David said I believe in the God the God. And notice what else he said. The Lord is, is right now, is present tense. He didn't say that maybe I'll be saved out there somewhere. Maybe someday there will, uh, uh, will come a day that, that God will say to me, you're okay. You're going to go to heaven. You've done all these good works and they outweigh your bad works. So I'm going to let you in. He didn't say maybe so, hope so. He said God is, is right now, is. He he said, my God is my personal, personal, my shepherd, my shepherd. You see, our relationship to the Lord is a personal relationship. Our parents can't be saved for us. Our brothers, our sisters, our neighbors cannot be saved for us, regardless of how good they are and how godly they are and how saintly they are. The Bible says that we have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. David said, the Lord is my shepherd. Amen. Amen. Can you say that today? Can you say that he is your shepherd? Praise God. You can if you put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Nobody can take that away from you. The Lord has a table prepared. A table land, a higher ground, a table land above, above meager existence, a life that is full and meaningful. What is a full and meaningful life? It's a life serving Jesus. What is our purpose in this world? Do you understand what your purpose is? Are you searching for a purpose? Well, let me tell you, you don't get to make that decision. Because before the foundation of the world, God had a purpose for you. Before the world began, he had a purpose. And you can't change that. God is sovereign. He's got a purpose. And what is that purpose? That purpose is to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. Is what you're doing glorifying Jesus? Then you're out of the purpose of God. We're to glorify Him. Well, Jesus uh, uh, shed His blood on Calvary's cross to prepare a table for us. Table of all tables. Meal of all meals. And let me ask you this. Have you been bypassing the table prepared for you? Now, I want you to listen carefully. Have you been bypassing the table prepared for you? If you have, if you have a desire today, if there's an inkling in your heart today to come to the table, to come to the table that God has set before you through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. If there's any kind of desire there, don't let it pass. 
don't let it pass. When I was a boy, we all ate at the same table. That doesn't happen much now, does it? But when I was growing up, we all ate at the same table. And if we missed it, there was no second chance. <laughs> Number one, it'd all be gone. And uh, there wouldn't be anything to eat. At our house, you didn't go to the refrigerator and get a Coke or Pepsi or uh, something like that. Maybe once a month, my dad would get, let us have Cokes for, you know, Saturday. We didn't have cakes and, and uh, potato chips and moon pies and all that laying around like I do now. <laughs> if I don't have moon pies at the house, I'm, 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 I'm in trouble. I got, to, I got to go to Walmart to get the moon pies. We didn't have all that. I mean, mother fixed a meal and that was it. You ate. If you missed it, you didn't, you didn't eat till the next meal. Listen, my friends. One day, it'll be too late to eat at the meal that God has prepared for you. To eat from the table land, from the cross. To eat from the blessed uh, joy that God gives to us in receiving Him as Lord and Savior. One day, it'll be too late. One day, you won't have a desire to come. It'll be past. You won't have a desire. Dr. Truett, as you know, was pastor of First Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas from about 1900 to 1944. And one night early as pastor, of course they were driving buggies and that was their transportation on the most part. He got a call one night at his house about 2 o'clock in the morning. And one of the servants went out and got the horse hooked up to the buggy because the man said to Dr. Truett, I want you to come to my house. He says, my daughter is dying. And she loved to hear you preach. And she loved to come to First Baptist Church in Dallas. I want you to come. So they got the buggy ready. And he went across the town of Dallas to where she was. And she stood with the, he stood with the family as they witness that child going into eternity. And the daddy said, Dr. Truett, I want you to preach the sermon at the funeral. She loved to hear you preach. I want you to do it. And he did. And, and at the end of the service, he said, Dr. Truett, can, can I ride with you to the cemetery? I'd like to talk to you. So he got into buggy with Dr. Truett as they made their way to the cemetery for the, for the burial. He said, you know, Dr. Truett, years ago when I first started coming to First Baptist Church at Dallas to hear you preach, you'd give the invitation and I would tremble. I was under such deep conviction and it just tore me apart, he said. He said, I would leave and walk the streets of Dallas until I got ease in my mind in my heart and all that bad feeling left. He said, go back the next Sunday, the same thing will happen again. But he said, Dr. Truy, for the last several months, I come to hear you preach. And I don't feel a thing. Note it, I have no conviction. There's no uneasiness in my heart. I don't feel a thing. And Dr. Truett said, as he told this experience, he said, I didn't have the heart to tell him that he had passed the deadline. The Spirit of God would no longer deal with his heart. He rejected the Lord so long till his heart had become cold and indifferent to God. And it was too late. Every time you say no to the wooing of God's Holy Spirit in your life, the next time will be easier to say no. Each time will be easier until there come a point where there'll be no inkling in your heart whatsoever to come to the Lord. Don't come to that time in your life. The Bible says the Spirit of God will not always strive with man. There is a point 
Don't go past it. It'll be too late. It's God's deadline. Only He knows where that is. But I can tell you this. If you have conviction in your heart this morning, God is drawing you. You're not at that point yet. You can come to the Lord and be saved today. Let's stand up. Our heads bowed and eyes closed. Every head bowed. Every eye closed. I don't know what, in, what God is asking you to do this morning. I don't know what He's saying to you. But there's one thing for sure. Whatever He is saying to you that He wants you to do publicly, you need to do that today because the Bible teaches us that we're to be public in our profession. Uh, the Bible doesn't teach uh, secret discipleship. Nicodemus for a while was a secret disciple. And then uh, uh, the other guy that helped him uh, take the body of Jesus to burial was also a secret disciple for a while. But when it came down to it, they had to openly say, I'm a Christian. I'm saved. I accept Christ. And they openly. See, the Bible says that we're to confess with our mouth and that we're to receive in our hearts we're to believe in our hearts. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You say, I'm waiting for a feeling. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you're going to have a feeling when you get saved. You show me that in the Bible, anywhere, where you're going to have some kind of emotion. People have different emotions when they come to know the Lord. Some don't have any outward emotion. Some shout, some cry. Some do various things, but the Bible doesn't tell us that we're going to have a certain experience or, or we're going to see some kind of sign or we're going to feel something. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You need to call on him today and be saved. There's some here that are lost. You've told me you're lost. You've been honest with me about it. I'm sure you've been honest with God about it. But listen... Be honest with God and come and receive the Lord. Don't wait. Oh, my friends, it's so important. Don't wait. Don't do it. Debbie's going to start playing. Whatever God is asking you to do this morning, you come. Right now, you come. Let God have His way in your heart. Maybe you need to surrender your life afresh to the Lord. You need to come before Him in prayer right here in the altar. You come on as God speaks to your heart. You've got a need in your life. Come on and do it. As God speaks to you now, come on.